Welcome to Issues That Matter. My guest today is Robert Maripol, and Robert and I are going to be discussing the movie Being the Ricardos. So I had first um, told you about it, and then you um, you saw the movie. Overall, what was your reaction? Well, let me first, you know, sort of introduce myself to make sure people understand why I would have this reaction. Um, right. uh, I, my name is Robert Maripol, but I was born Robert Rosenberg, and I'm the younger son of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, who were arrested, tried, convicted, and ultimately es executed on June 19, 1953, uh, for conspiracy to commit espionage. That was the official charge. It was known in the public as they were the people who stole the secret of the atomic bomb and gave it to the Soviet Union. Um, I, I didn't believe that, you know, I think I can prove that they didn't steal the secret of the atomic bomb, but that's a totally different story. Uh, however, while in the same summer that uh, they were executed in uh, is when being the Ricardos is set, which mm -hmm. is the story of uh, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz, who uh, uh, played uh, the Ricardos uh, and uh, on TV, the most popular television sitcom in history. I mean, I think they had 60 million viewers uh, at that point. Uh, and the show is, is set during a week of production in the middle of the summer of 1953. Uh, and it is about their interactions. Well, a lot of it has to do with the very well-known story of, of Lucy and, uh, and Desi, that he had all these affairs on the side and she you know, finally left him because of it. Um, and this was the week in which she was discovering it or was really confirming her suspicions and it was also the week when she was pregnant and uh, they were discussing whether you could show pregnant women on TV in a sitcom. I mean, there was all, uh, all this interpersonal stuff going on. And at the same time, uh, the, it was the height of the Red Scare the McCarthy era Red Scare, which, you know, given my parents' case and the research I've done on it and the life I've pursued, I'm, I'm kind of an expert on that. Uh, and so that really uh, is where my credentials for discussing the film come from. And that's the final part of, of a multifaceted film is that it was during this period of the Red Scare that the fact that uh, Lucille Ball signed a, uh, a petition paper for nominating a Communist Party uh, official or member who was running for state office in the state of California 20 years before during the 1930s was dredged up by some right-wing newspaper uh, to as an expose of communists in uh, Hollywood. And that was a big deal then. Uh, Hollywood screenwriters were, were being subpoenaed. Uh, some of them refused to answer questions. They were sent to jail. They were, it was the case of the Hollywood 10. This was a major cultural battle going on. And so it is that aspect of the film which I feel most qualified to comment on. So comment. <laughs> well, uh, I think the most remarkable thing ab about the film, and and I, I and, and particularly the public reaction to the film, but I'll start with the film itself, is that uh, what is is that there is a real distortion of Lucy and uh, I mean I should say uh, yeah Lucy Lucy and Desi's politics, okay, mm -hmm. basically. Uh, the reality of the situation was that the, the Lucille Ball was quite a, was a leftist. She mm -hmm. wasn't necessarily a communist, uh, 
but there was a lot of left and left liberal activity going on in Hollywood, as there is today. Um, and she was a part of it. Now, she wasn't a leader of it, but she was a part. And one of the way the major distortions of the film is to downplay and to accept what the CBS television network's justification for not canceling the show of somebody who signed the petition paper for a communist um, was that uh, she just did it to please her socialist grandfather, that she really, her heart wasn't really in it and she didn't really mean it. And one of the ways, uh, and, and one of the ways they, they deal with this is that they talk about Desi Arnaz's family, his father, who's Cuban. Uh, that was another aspect of the Lucille Ball show, the, 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 the sort of racial, uh, um, what am I, what's the word I'm looking for? The sort of daring nature of, of, of showing a light-skinned Cuban married to an American woman uh, was, was a little bit risque. Uh, and but the Arnez family came from an upper class family in Cuba. His father was the mayor of the city's second of the Cuba's second largest city, Santiago de Cuba. And the what happened, this was during the Batista regime in the 1940s. Uh, and Batista was a right wing dictator. Uh, deeply connected to, you know, essentially Cuba was a mafia run state. Um, and uh, the mayor of Santiago de Cuba was quite a bit to the left of that. And so Batista uh, sent his troops uh, to burn down their farm and murder, murder their livestock. And Desi Arnaz barely escaped with his life. But the way Aaron Sorkin transforms this is he kind of fudges on the dates and makes it seem like that these were communist rebels who burned down uh, the, the, the farm of Desi Arnaz's father, uh, and therefore that he was anti-communist and would not tolerate Lucy being a communist. Uh, the reality couldn't be further from the truth, uh, not that he was a communist, but that he was it was right wingers who burned down his farm. Uh, the Fidel inspired revolution didn't even start until 1953, which is actually when this show is set. Uh, so having, so there's this major historical distortion. And then to make matters worse, J. Edgar Hoover is presented as the hero of the show who Put, who says, oh yeah, Lucy's not really a communist. You can go ahead and, 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 uh, and continue to broadcast. And again, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, so in fact, I, I, it kind of blew me away. I, I was reading some reviews of uh, the, being the Ricardos and one of the reviews uh, talked about, uh, well, Desi wasn't, uh, Desi was an anti-communist because the communists burned down his farm. I mean, they just took this total distortion and reprinted it as fact. Um, so the point that I'm making here is that the portrayal of what was going on in Hollywood during the McCarthy period is so distorted and uh, not dealt with. And if so, it is that's the part that kind of blows me away. Uh, and and so, you know, I don't they, they do a much better job of dealing with Hollywood sexism, of dealing with, uh, you know, marital infidelity, of dealing with all the personal issues. But when it comes to the larger political setting, uh, they are 100 percent incorrect. Um, and so then the question arises, why was Lucy able to get away with it? Why wasn't the show canceled? Mm 
Uh, and, and the answer is, I, I would say this was kind of a, an early version of too big to fail. Okay. Uh, what I mean by that is that CBS was making so much money and their advertisers, uh, Philip Morris, the purveyor of cancer sticks, uh, um, were making so much money that they were unwilling to cancel the show. They were just going to sweep the politics under the rug. Unfortunately, during the McCarthy period, um, there were tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of people who could not sweep their left-wing views under the rug and who ended up losing their jobs, uh, in some cases losing their lives, in some cases going to prison, and in my parents' case being, being executed. And one of the, the, the ironies of the situation is, is that at my mother's trial, just about the only piece of physical evidence, in fact, it may be the only piece of physical evidence presented against my mother at her trial was that she had signed the nominating papers for someone running on the Communist Party ticket for a position in New York City. And yet, and, and, and you know, that was used to show that she was a communist spy. Lucille Ball's signing of a very similar kind of document uh, 20 years earlier uh, was dismissed as unimportant. That's pretty powerful what you just said, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's not only being the Ricardos, but don't you think many Hollywood movies has a license to fabricate stuff? Well, well, yeah, I mean, you know, and oftentimes the license to fabricate is a reflection of the politics of the fabricator. Uh, um, you know, and, and, and it, it is not an accident that these things are called culture wars, that uh, at the time on the 1950s, there were, there were left wing writers, there were Communist Party writers, uh, and they did want to influence the films that they were writing, and they wanted to make films that glorified uh, labor strife and labor, labor struggles that glorified people fighting for justice that that you know glorified particularly during World War II uh, anti-Nazi themes um, that was so big and yet there were other forces powerful forces mostly representing the the big studios and the moneyed interests who wanted more acceptable themes to be discussed. Uh, you know, they, they wanted police shows. They wanted the cops to be the heroes. Mm -hmm. They were the ones that produced another very popular series called Dragnet, one of the first police shows. Mm -hmm. And so there's been a constant battle going on in Hollywood over what kind of, you know, do you want kind of John Wayne Let's let's the cowboys kill all the Indians kind of movies. Right. Or do we want movies that glorify the struggle of people to obtain fair wages? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and you can see throughout the decades that these this kind of con conflict goes on and this kind of controversy goes on. So and and Aaron Sorkin, who is the the, the screenwriter for both being the Ricardos and a whole bunch of other things, mm -hmm. he his liberal politics, kind of mainstream liberal politics, are reflected in the way he treats the McCarthy period, which is basically to say, yeah, maybe if you're a real communist, then it's probably okay to blacklist you. Uh, but unless you're a real communist, it's probably not okay. And so we should separate the left from the liberals. And the liberals are acceptable, but the left really isn't. And that's where we draw the line. Uh, 
And and you know if you if you followed the his Chicago Seven trial film that that came out the film before this one, uh, you see that it's exactly the kind of thing that he takes the anti-war radicals and he transforms them into liberals uh, who are against the war not because they support the Vietnamese and the battle against American imperialism but they're against the war because they want to make the United States a better place. Uh, and he does a sleight of hand of transforming the, uh, the prosecutors into Republican oriented Nixonites, when in reality, these people were being charged because they disrupted the Demo or attempted to disrupt the Democratic National Convention. Right. Right. Uh, so, you know, this is, this kind of effort to separate left from liberals by a, a mainstream liberal like Sorkin is reflected in his films. Um, and even though they're not overtly right wing, the right wing elements of Hollywood are the ones who are producing all the police procedurals uh, that glorify, I mean, you know, when you think about uh, television and, and film, but uh, I mean, I think film to a large degree, the comic book movies are essentially diversionary entertainment. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, everybody likes that. You watch all these superheroes blow each other up and, and, and that's considered exciting. Um, uh, but the, they're also a steady stream, particularly on television, of police propaganda. You know, they're always the heroes. They're always doing good. It is, uh, and that, of course, is a reflection of the politics of the people who are producing these films. Uh, so it's, I don't think it should surprise people. And what, what people have to realize is that none of this is socially neutral it all has an impact in one way or another. Uh, you know, whether it's, it's, it's to divert people from focusing on real problems or whether it's to promote a certain point of view, you're going to find that in Hollywood, whether it's in film or television. And, and the Ricardos was, was a particularly uh, clear example of that. Now, when I had first contacted you to to uh, do an interview about the movie, and you was you know kind of hesitant at the beginning, um, did the movie anger you? Um, well, to see that distortion did anger me, you know, um, and to and it 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 does whenever you have inside information and that information shows you beyond a reasonable doubt that what is being presented as fact is actually fiction. It, it is really annoying. Mm -hmm. But if that fictionalization uh, is a denial of what happened to your family, even if it's indirect, mm -hmm. uh, which is really what this is, that, that really can anger you. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's, uh, I was, but my hesitancy in, in, in at first was, uh, not because I, I, I feared uh, being angry, uh, but it's because I hadn't seen the film yet. Uh, mm -hmm. And I didn't know, I, and I made a point of not reading any reviews before seeing the, the mm -hmm. film because I didn't want it to color uh, my view. Uh, and I, I, I admit that when, particularly when they were doing this thing about Desi Arnaz's family being burned out by Cuban communists mm -hmm. when he was being burned out by the troops of a fascist dictator. 
uh, it it like it left me with my mouth hanging open, you know, uh, and it 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 you know, and it 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 also raised questions in my mind because, you know, someone who create what is is the person who creates this kind of distortion. Uh, does that person lack integrity? You know, are is you know, can you say? to Aaron Sorkin, you're a liar. Uh, or does he have the defense? Well, this is a fictionalization and I'm an artist and this is, this is my way of telling the story. Um, and my feeling is, is that's an illegitimate response because I often ask if, well, if someone's fictionalizing something, are they distorting what happened or are, are they, or what, what they doing, is it in tune with what's happened? I mean, after all, if whenever you are reproducing the personal conversations of a couple of people in which nobody's been in the room with them, of course, you're gonna have to make up what they say. Uh, mm -hmm. You, there's, there's, there's no, you know, unless there's a transcript, which people usually don't maintain transcripts of their household conversations. Right. Uh, so unless there's a transcript of it, uh, you're not going to be able to verify the accuracy of it. But the question is, is does that com, uh, does that co fictionalized conversation is it in tune with the larger picture? Or is it does, does it distort the larger picture? And when you look at being the Ricardos, the political context in which this entire production is placed uh, is um, is distorted. Um, and so I think that's an illegitimate. I mean, that's that's where uh, the film becomes propaganda. You know, okay. uh, and and that's and I would just if you want to describe propaganda not as honest portrayal of a political position, but as dishonest portrayal of a political position, mm -hmm. uh, and and I know that that you know in some places the the words the word propaganda is used to describe honest portrayal of a political position. So I know there are more than one definition, but that's the way I see what happened in being the Ricardos. So the uh, time frame, you were aware that of the time frame discrepancy. Would you say that most people who went to see the film was not aware of that discrepancy? Oh, I would say almost no one was aware of it. Okay. I mean, I, I mean, you know, how many people know the life story of Desi Arnaz and can connect that with the history of the Cuban Revolution and went on what went on in Cuba in the 1940s and the 1950s? Certainly a typical American audience uh, would be clueless about this. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it would have to be somebody uh, who was either historically interested in that period, like a historian, okay. or someone who was personally involved, like me. Uh, right. And in order to be personally involved, given that my parents were arrested when I was three, and that in 1953, I was six, uh, you would, you know, and I'm now 74, I'll be 75 next month, you'd have to be older than 75 years old, uh, in order to uh, in order to want to you know to have any personal experience of this that you would remember, uh, and I don't think there are that many people who are over seventy five who are going out and seeing this film. I mean, uh, usually audiences for films are younger. Uh, uh, this may have attracted a somewhat older demographic, but probably not that old. Without naming names, would you say that a lot of filmmakers in Hollywood take um, license to distort stuff? 
Um, yeah, I think I think so. I think Absolutely. so. I mean, you whenever you whenever you know whenever you see the phrase based upon a true story, right? That is what what should what what they're not saying in glaring flashing headlines. Uh, lots of untruth, lots of phoniness, lots of you know. It's like you the liberty that people can take with the based upon. Uh, it's it's and and what's what's weird about it is even when something is presented as you know based upon or uh, or their people the film people or a, a lot of people who view these things just take it as fact. Mm -hmm. I mean, just like the film reviewer for a major magazine, you know, saying that uh, Desi Arnaz was a Cuban re re refugee running away from communist Cuba, even though in 1953, Cuba wasn't communist. Uh right, <laughs> right, right. So um, I think your perspective was really good and it's really important and People should be aware that, you know, if you're a Hollywood anything, that the uh, that the truth can be somehow fudged. Wouldn't you agree? Oh well, yeah, I mean, you know, I think what what you what you have is is one of the common phrases in the English language is the camera doesn't lie. Right. But, but the reality is the camera lies. Uh, it it may lie in in subtle ways. Um, and so that gets people see fiction as fact. And I know this from my own experience with my parents' case that, uh, there was an author, a person who I have respect for and I liked, uh, who wrote what she termed a fictional autobiography of my mother. Uh, this was like in the 1980s, I think. Um, and it was just her imagining what it must have been like to be Ethel Rosenberg based upon what she knew. Uh -huh. And, you know, and she labeled it as a fictional, that it was fiction, that it was, well, I can't tell you at the time, since I was, this was at a time when I was out speaking extensively about my parents' case, uh, that, uh, how many, a number of people came up to me and said, have you seen the new biography of your mother? You know, they didn't understand the difference between a fictional autobiography and a biography that people, readers, you know, they, they I think that we have a fascination with, with, with visual representation and with uh, the, the written word that, I mean, if you look at the power behind the Bible, uh, it is, you know, human beings uh, are, it can be extremely motivated to believe the written word as gospel. Uh, and where do you think that phrase comes from? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, so yes, uh, that that kind of distortion comes up and it then becomes up to the viewer to try to get a critical reading of the situation. And, you know, you have, you, if you want to be responsible about it, essentially you have one or two choices. Uh, you either uh, look at the film and take it with a grain of salt and say, I don't know how much of that's true and how much of it's false, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, um, and uh, the alternative is to do your own research. Right. Um, but even that can stymie you. Uh, for instance, I decided to do that. I, uh, you know, in preparation for our talk today, I, I went online and researched uh, being the Ricardos. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were under, when you, got to a Wikipedia page or some other basic page about 
the Rico being the Ricardos, there was a, a line that said frequently asked questions. The first question was, how much of this is true? Mm. And I so I clicked on the button and read the short paragraph that said, well, the time frame was compressed, but basically this is a true story. Not one word was said about the McCarthy period and the distortion. So mm -hmm. somebody even doing their research might have a difficult time mm -hmm. finding out this distortion. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not necessarily an easy task. Uh, so perhaps if you don't wanna spend your whole time if you want to know whether a movie is true, uh, probably the best thing to do is to just take it all with a grain of salt and mm -hmm. uh, because distortion is rampant. So, Robert, our time is up. So you've been listening to Rob Maripol. I'm Cynthia Pooler. This is Issues That Matter. And if you like this show, subscribe to my YouTube page. Robert, it's always a pleasure talking to you, and thank you, everybody, for 